Um, okay, hi everyone. I'm Leshev. Uh, I'm a Circus Fellow, uh, so most of you know me. I'm going to talk about the uh, uncertainty, about rationality, and how can we um, use a model of both to better explain strategic voting. Okay, it's based on several joint works, uh, some with my former advisor, Andrew Rosenshine, and his student, Omer Lev, some with uh, David Parks, and another student of his, James Zhu. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll start with an example. Uh, suppose that uh, we're not happy with just the Coke here, and next meeting we want to replace it with something else. But it can only be one drink, because uh, there's limited budget for some reason. Uh, so each one of us, or each one of the, of the participants, has uh, some preferences over uh, which drinks uh, we want to be at the, at the next meeting. Uh, and uh, each one of us has one vote. Okay, so and suppose, for example, that uh, every one of these three votes for his uh, top preference, then uh, we'll get these votes. And if we have many more voters, you know, maybe we can you know, collect a lot of votes, and we see something like this. Okay, so you can consider this like a poll. Um, okay. And under these votes, beer is going to win because it has the largest number of votes. Okay, this is just called the plurality voting rule, which is the simplest voting rule that we use all the time. Okay, now suppose that uh, you're the, this guy, the, the gray uh, voter, and you're faced with, with these numbers. So like I said, this can be a poll or Maybe this is just your conjecture of how people are going to vote based on how you know them, or maybe that's how they voted previous time. And now you should cast your vote, okay? And you can see your preferences. So try to ignore your own personal preferences over drinks and consider these preferences up here. And uh, okay, so tell me now, suppose you have a chance to change your vote, okay? Seeing, seeing this. So who would keep uh, his vote for Coke? for Diet Coke? How many would vote for Diet Coke? No one, okay. Who would vote for juice? Roughly a half, a bit above half. Who would vote for wine? Three people, okay. Uh, who would vote for beer? No one, okay. Uh, someone who chose wine, why? Anyone cares to explain? <laughs> Couldn't override uh, these preferences? <laughs> okay, uh, someone who chose juice, just to explain why, uh, why is juice may be a better idea than stick with Diet Coke, for example. So it seems that if there are five people or six people like me, then we could get our second choice instead of our last choice, and then we will all those three drinkers. Yeah, it, in some sense, it seems like juice has a higher chance of winning, so maybe it's a I mean, if there are, you know, 45 other people like you, you maybe you can get diet coked. So it's not completely clear where, where uh, the line goes through. And in the first half of this talk, at least, I'll try to describe a formal model that perhaps motivates uh, this decision and, uh, a, and selects maybe juice in this case. And, and but more general, maybe you can say what voters do in other cases as well. Okay. Mm. OK, so first, I'll, so of course, I'm not the first one working on, on uh, models for strategic voting. So I introduce some arguable desiderata and some features from other theories and why they're, in my opinion, insufficient to explain strategic voting. Then I'll introduce um, like this notion of uncertainty that, that I'm going to talk about, uh, how it fits with a model of a bounded rational voter. And then we'll leverage it to a society of, of uh, strategic bounded rational voters and see what uh, voting equilibrium means. And hopefully this will take roughly half the talk and we can use the remaining 20, 25 minutes to discuss how some of these ideas extend uh, to more general games. Okay. And, uh, if anything is unclear during the talk, don't hesitate to, to stop me and interrupt. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, okay, so the uh, main thing I have to say about that is when I say voting, try to not think about political voting. Uh, it's hard, and I think that, so a lot of the people who study voting are very focused on political voting. Personally, I think that's a wrong thing to focus on for a various reason. The main reason is that it's much more complicated. Okay, it involves many more factors 
than the factors that the simple mathematical models capture. Okay? So try to think about something neutral, you know, like voting over drinks. You know, drinks don't lie to the voters. Drinks don't kind of form coalitions and uh, uh, do all kinds of fishy things. There are no primary voting over drinks. Okay, so uh, think about this, you know, simple, or maybe, you know, a committee voting over candidates for the faculty. Something more neutral. Maybe that's not the best example. What's that? Uh, so we can think about it as something that happens at once, okay, like one-shot game. We can also think about it if it's a committee that uh, it's kind of a rolling game where people have an opinion to change, change their vote. Okay, but they're not changing their opinion. They can only change their vote. Okay, so we can think about it both ways and, and in the main result you see how it applies to both of these uh, settings. Uh, okay, so theoretic criteria, I'm a game theorist, so we, we like to think in terms of first rational uh, decision makers and outcomes should be some sort of equilibrium. You know, maybe some refinement of Nash equilibrium or some other like very known solution concept from game theory. That's what makes us happy. Um, behavioral criteria, so um, we would like to assume, uh, so th most game theorists maybe don't really care about that, but uh, if we're dealing with behavioral game theory and with things that do uh, in the real world, then we would like to assume uh, reasonable beliefs and reasonable capabilities. Okay. Uh, scientific criteria, that's more general, that's of course not just for voting, so we'd like a simple and robust model, we'd like it to be somehow consistent with what we see in the real world. Uh, discriminative power means that uh, basically it, it kind of predict something in error, so it doesn't say, well, I have no idea what's going to happen. You know, everything can happen, that's not discriminative. Um, okay, and these are arguable, other people can have other criteria they care about. Um, okay, so let's start, start with some very simple uh, ideas and, and where, where they kind of fail or, or don't, are not completely sufficient. So we can just assume that everybody always vote for their top reference. Okay, uh, what's the problem with this? Apparently, that's not what happens in the real world, and even in this simple example we saw, so most of you, or actually no one, uh, suggested to vote for the truthful preference, which was Diet Coke. Okay, so that's not such a good one, maybe. Um, okay, so in game theory, well, the, the first thing actually would assume even before truthful voting is that people uh, play Nash equilibrium. What's the problem with Nash equilibrium? Anyone wants to take a guess? Okay, so, yeah. Okay, that, that's one thing, but uh, in Nash, to play Nash equilibrium, you don't have to know other people's belief, right? You only have to best respond to what they do, okay? Uh, but, uh, okay, so in a dynamic setting, you don't have to know their belief. In a study, it, if it's a one-shot game, then you're right, it's a problem. I mean, how would I compute this Nash equilibrium? Uh, but even if it's a... Uh, kind of a dynamic setting where I just want to be happy that I'm playing a best response to what everybody else does, then the problem is that everything is Nash equilibrium. Okay, a single voter is almost always uh, powerless to change the outcome. So, you know, if everybody vote for the worst candidate, that's also a Nash equilibrium. Okay, unless there's a tie or almost a tie, which is kind of a rare event, uh, everything is Nash equilibrium. Okay, so it's not very discriminative. Well, it's very non-discriminative. Uh, okay, so of course the uh, economists uh, tend to think about the models of expected utility maximization. Uh, I think, so maybe that's the, the, main, um, the, the main reason why I kind of try to, to study this direction is that I don't believe expected utility maximization. Not because it's, it's not a, a good idea to do, but it's not what people do in practice. The, it's, of course, not my idea. There are tons of studies in uh, experimental psychology, uh, cognitive psychology, that show that people don't understand even probabilities. Uh, even when asked explicitly about the probability of some event, they usually kind of replace the question in their head with some different question and answer that question. Uh, definitely, they cannot maximize expected utility, and especially not when it involves their events, like ties, for example. Um, and even if they could, 
So first of all, it contradicts the capabilities or, or cognitive tendencies of people, and voters are usually people. And second, even if uh, they could do that, so it's not very clear where should these uh, probabilistic belief come from. Okay, so when you see a poll, do you know the you know, probability that it, exactly you know, a certain tie is going to happen? Can you even estimate it? It's not clear at all. Okay, so this is why I don't like this type of models, and there are a lot of them. Uh, heuristics are basically nice. The problem with heuristics is that from a game theoretic point of view, we'd like to something more justified, right? We want to say that heuristics is somehow justified by some notion of rationality or self-interest. Just saying that, you know, here's some heuristic, it's, well, it's not enough if you're a game theorist, at least. And decision diagrams, so some papers have diagrams like this. Um, one problem with it is like uh, Anudian said, so this diagram, for example, has to assume that you know exactly what everybody else thinks. And on top of that, I'm not sure that even if it, something like that can describe the data, uh, I wouldn't call that an intuitive model. Okay. So I'm not happy with this either. Okay. And this, I guess these first two uh, groups of criteria can be kind of grouped under bounded rationality. Yes. Or have a question? <laughs> Because uh, uh, as an explanation of how people behave. If you ask me, sort of so it may describe what happens. Yes. It may be you know, a good description of an outside observer of what happens. You can say that you know, seeing what they do, I can infer that they're actually, in fact, maximizing their expected utility. But if you try to, if, you know, if you pose a voter with a situation and ask him what he's going to do, it does not seem that, uh, well, he doesn't know even what this expected utility is. He doesn't know what the distribution here is. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so let's go on. And I, now I'm starting to introduce uh, my model, or our model. Uh, and it will involve uncertainty. So First, just think about uh, the information that the voter has. So there are no distribution here. There's just, say, one poll or one score vector, just the score of every, each one of the candidates. Okay? And we, we'll talk about these uh, score vectors as states. Okay? These are the world states. Um, and uh, now we introduce uncertainty. So it basically means that our voter will assume that the, um, the score, the final score of a candidate can be, can be within some range. And if we want to be more specific, then each voter will have a single parameter, okay, which will be his uncertainty parameter or uncertainty value, at least zero. And uh, th this is the set of possible word states okay, that are sufficiently close to, to the poll or to the state S. Okay? So as long as the scores are kind of within these ranges, okay, the voter thinks of these as possible states without assigning any probabilities to them. Okay, so one example, for example, we can, uh, the parameter can be an additive parameter, and the voter, so if the score in the poll is 90, the voter can assume that the actual score, the final score, would be anything between uh, 90 minus Ri and 90 plus Ri, and the same for the other scores. Okay, we can also think about a multipli multiplicative version, or you know, choose your favorite metric. Okay, it wouldn't matter uh, for this talk. Okay, the, the uncertainty model is clear. Th this slide kind of captures the entire uncertainty model, so we still need to talk about the behavior. Okay. Yeah, so this means that these are the, the important slides now. Okay. Uh, okay, so we have this uh, notion of uncertainty. Uh, we have some uh, set of possible states. Okay. Uh, we say that, uh, so the actions in this game are just the candidates, right? This is a very simple game. The, the Diet Coke is an action and a candidate. So we say that an action or a candidate, A prime, S dominates another candidate, A, if it's always, uh, like if the voter is never hurt by, by voting for A prime, and it's sometimes helpful for him. Okay? So it can be like sometimes better than vote for A, and uh, never worse. Okay? And what do I mean by, so this seems just like the, the definition of dominance in general. So what's the difference? Why local dominance? 
Uh, so why do I say always? So here it means that in every possible state, so this has to apply in every possible state, only in the states that fall in these ranges, and the voter doesn't care what happened in the hypothetical state, say, where wine has the largest number of votes, okay? Because this is not considered a possible state. Okay, this is clear, division of dominance. Okay, uh, okay, so now let's see how, how would a voter vote. Suppose uh, we have some voter I who's currently voting for some candidate AI at some given state. Okay, so a strategic response of, uh, of this voter would be first find some candidate that dominates current candidate, if there is one. Okay, if there is such a candidate, vote for it. Okay, like change your vote to one that dominates your current action. Uh, if there are more than one, you know, pick arbitrarily. And otherwise, if nothing dominates your current vote, just keep your current vote. Okay. Um, what's the problem with this? So I argued that you know probabilities are complicated, and how should the voter kind of capture the entire probability space and, and compute expected utility? But why should it be simpler to compute dominance relation? Maybe you know I just now have a different problem, which is just as hard, just as complicated for the voter. So in the next slide, I'm going to argue that. It's actually not hard. Uh, there are two main lemmas. They're not technically difficult. I'm not going to prove them, uh, but uh, their intuition is important. So first, I think that actually the voter does not, have to, does not have to think explicitly about these ranges. There is some threshold that only depends on the state and the uncertainty level. I'm not saying how to compute it, but there is, it exists. Okay. And all that matters is that threshold. The, uh, as far as the voter concerns, candidates whose score is above the threshold, they can win. And candidates whose score is below the threshold can't win. Okay? So the threshold depends on the uncertainty, but can, we don't have to go through this stage of, uh, of these intervals. And uh, why, why does this matter? Because um, voting according to local dominance just means one of two things. Okay? If you're voting to someone below the threshold, then you just uh, move your vote to the one you like best above the threshold. Okay, but there there have to be uh, at least two because if there's just one, that it does not dominate your current action. Okay, um, and if you already vote for someone above the threshold, okay, then usually you'd keep your vote, you'd vote your vote unless you happen to vote for the one you like least. Okay, among those, if you. If among all those above the threshold, you vote for the worst one, then you dump him, go to someone else. Okay? So this sounds just like a heuristic, but this heuristic actually coincides with the notion of local dominance. So it's a rational heuristic. It, uh, the notion of local dominance justifies this simple threshold heuristic. Uh, so we'll do some examples just to see that, uh, Can I ask a question that it's about clear. The model? Yeah. So Do you want to wait until after the example because it might Okay. But it's just not the model. Not okay. Not okay. The, okay. Sure. So, so this um, set of the, this dominance uh, notion of dominance, it uh, it's kind of like reflecting, supposed to reflect what an agent's view of the world is in some sense, right? Like what his beliefs about the other. Yeah. What are. it can be. What but can. you're restricting it to just kind of the tallies of these votes, whereas the preferences are richer than that, right? Like each player had a. Yeah. So that's a very good point. So note that the voter actually does not care about other voters' preferences. Yeah. It only cares, so the world states are what voters do, not what they think or want. Oh, so you're already assuming that the mechanism is going to take a count well, The of mechanism these is just plurality voting. Everybody just raised their hand. To, so I didn't change the mechanism. Right, but I'm saying you're, you're already restricting the class of mechanisms in some sense, right? Because you can imagine. I'm talking more. about a specific mechanism, not a restricted okay. class of mechanism. I'm talking about just plurality voting, which okay. is a very widely used mechanism used you know, thousands of times each day. So I think it's. And there are, there are hundreds of papers just on this mechanism, so okay. I think it justifies in our Okay, so the question uh, is understanding attention. this mechanism and not like building a, the best possible mechanism. No, no, so I'm not going to build any other okay. mechanism. In the second half of the talk, I hope to you know, talk about how some of these ideas extend to other, kind, other types of games and mechanisms, but uh, we're only talking about royalty voting. Okay. okay? So, but uh, uh, continuing on this line, 
you focus on plurality, but isn't your model applicable also to like scoring voting yeah, rules? So then because certain you can, you can you know, these bars could be the scores yeah, of the candidates. Yeah, we can definitely extend the definitions, okay? It's not clear if the results extend as well. Yeah, like the realistic, the weak point size with yeah. the thing, okay. okay. Uh, plurality is much uh, simpler to think about because the action uh, set is much simpler. In plurality, there are, no, every candidate is an action. That's it. In all other voting rules, you have like an exponential number of actions, so it's harder to, to reason about that. Okay. okay, so we'll replace the juice with, uh, with candidates. Okay, so suppose that uh, this is the threshold and only this candidate is a possible winner. So what would our voter do in this case? No, because C does not dominate A, okay? It's never better to vote for C, okay? Because you, you prefer A. So the only thing that can happen is that you'll somehow uh, uh, make C get elected, okay, when instead of some other candidate that you might prefer better, okay? It's never actually better. Um, okay, what about if we lower the threshold a bit? Now we have two uh, possible winners. Okay, but what will the voter do now? Yeah, now, now you should switch to C, right? Because the only uh, possible scenario in, uh, as far as the voter thinks where it's pivotal is when C is tied with E, okay? And in this scenario, it's better to vote for C. In every other scenario, it doesn't matter what you'll do, okay? So in this case, you'll move to C, okay? Yeah, here, yeah, sorry. So it's not that uh, it's never better, it's that, uh, okay, in this case, he's never pivotal, okay? Whatever happens can't affect the outcome. So it does not dominate, it's kind of indifferent between everything he does in all world states. In particular, there's no special reason to change your vote if, if you just don't care. Because C would win anyway? Yeah. So C? C would win anyway. So as far, the voter believes that C would win anyway. And so Yeah. And if there's only one, it's also a necessary winner in some sense. Yeah. If there's only one. Yeah. Yeah. So in exactly. this case, he knows that he's going to win no matter what he votes. Yeah. So he might as well keep his vote. So or he might just as well keep it or might as well switch because it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So, but we define it that he only switch if, so yeah. he has to have okay. some positive reason to actually mm -hmm. switch. Okay. Uh, it relates to uh, like, you know, loss aversion. So you need to actually gain something. And, yeah. and not never lose something if you, if you want to move. Okay. Uh, if there are more possible candidates, let's see. How much if there are more possible candidates, then uh, what will our voter do now? B. Yeah. B. Now move to B. Uh, and now suppose that he does vote for B and all these five are possible candidates. That's the harder case. Okay. So now he votes for someone above the threshold, right? So, so no. B might win. So the question is, would, would he change to A or not? And at least according to our model, he's not going to change. Why? Because there's a risk in changing, okay? Um, there's a risk that B will be tied with one of the other winners, okay, that, uh, uh, that our voter actually despise more than B. Okay, so by moving from B to A, he's taking a risk. So if, you know, if he's risk averse or, or loss averse, He'll just so A does not dominate B. So he would move. He would not move. He would just no, no, stay with. He would move to something more preferred to him only if it's above uh, I mean it's the bar is higher. Is that the, the heuristic? Yeah, so uh, so I give uh you can go back to, to the heuristic, yeah. A was higher. If B was below the uh, the threshold and A was above the threshold, then yes. Or if B was the worst one above the threshold, then also it would move to A. So in the last example that you gave. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Other way? No, I think you're going back. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Okay, sorry. Last example. Yeah. yeah. So here, even if the bar of A were higher than the one of B, it would not switch. To yeah, a. because it's no, it would not switch because it's still it's still a risky thing. They're all remember that he does not like weigh the probabilities. 
So is, he only cares if it's above threshold or below the threshold. Okay? But it means that another vote, so if A would be higher, yeah. maybe, and, and the threshold would also be higher, then it would happen. Okay? So it would only switch if B, the bar of B was the lowest one among those that are yeah. above. Yeah, not, not the lowest one, the, the least preferred one. Ah, the, least the one he hates one. more. Because then it, you have nothing to lose. You, know, you can always dump your worst candidate. He would stay with it. Yeah. Okay. okay. So if in this case he were he were he was voting for F, then he would switch. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Actually, and I think he could switch to either one because all of the other four dominant except D dominate F. Okay. They're all better than F. Um, okay. So I hope I convince you that, at least because we have a simple heuristic, that, just a second, that uh, we're okay with the behavioral criteria, because, so he's not doing anything like over complicated. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So, uh, I'm kind of confused by what you mean, like you already on one choice or already Okay, on so this choice. assumes kind of the iterative setting where suppose, you know, you're in a committee, you see the current votes and you have an opportunity to change, to change your vote. Okay, to talk about uh, one shot, we have to talk about beliefs, and I'll, I'll do that in the next slide. Okay. <coughs> um, okay, so uh, suppose that it, it uh, matches their beliefs and capabilities, uh, but in order to discuss you know, equilibrium or, or theoretic, either theoretic criteria, we need to talk about a society. Of, so, so now we have everybody are strategic. You know, they have different preferences. Okay, they may have different uncertainty levels. Uh, so first, we need to define an equilibrium, but once we defined this notion of, uh, like of one move, this induces a definition of equilibrium. Okay, an equilibrium is just a state where no one wants to move, okay, according to this definition of strategic move that we had before. Okay, this defines a voting equilibrium. Okay, so the best response of everyone according to his own beliefs is just to keep his own vote. And uh, so a sanity check is to see what happens in the extreme cases. So suppose there's no uncertainty at all, okay? Then there's just one possible state. The poll reflects exactly what's going to happen. Local dominance just boils down to best response. And voting equilibrium is just a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so it generalizes a notion of Nash equilibrium. What happens if there's infinite uncertainty, right? Then the voter has no idea what's going to happen. You know, every state is possible. Uh, local dominance just coincides with global dominance. And uh, voting in anything can be in equilibrium except when voters vote for their uh, least preferred candidate. Okay? Uh, but we're more interested in what happens in between. Okay? Because that's uh, the interesting range. Knowing exactly, so if you know exactly how others are going to vote, okay. Yeah, but he is strategic, but also other voters. Are yeah, but you, yeah, he's strategic but myopic. So you only so think of, again about this committee, okay? So you see the current scoreboard, okay, and you see can I actually affect the outcome now by changing my vote? If I can't, if there's like a two vote difference, then I just keep my vote. Okay, that's best response. Yes, but uh, maybe I provide my best response, but also somebody else provides it. What he thinks is his best response, and then the result actually can be worse for both of us. Yeah, it can. I mean, I, I didn't say if it's good or bad. I just said that okay. it boils down to Nash equilibrium. And like I said before, Nash equilibrium doesn't really mean much because yeah. almost anything is Nash yeah. equilibrium. Okay. Uh, so both of these are, are not so interesting because almost everything in Nash equilibrium, and again, the, and the second one is also a uh, very weak restriction on what voters do. Okay. Uh, so okay. So here's the main result. Uh, first of all, even if in uh, this, this diverse setting where, where voters have completely different preferences and completely different uncertainty levels, a voting equilibrium always exists. It's a pure equilibrium. And uh, further, if we think about, so equi equilibrium doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter if it's an iterative or a or one-shot game. Okay, so if we think about it as a one-shot game, we only say that an equilibrium exists, but we can say it in a stronger sense. Suppose that we have this 
committee where people can change a vote, and they start from an arbitrary state, okay? So they start from something, doesn't matter what, and then they have opportunities to like iteratively change your votes, uh, then they will necessarily converge uh, to an equilibrium. And um, even and the, even if they several voters change their vote at, at the same time. So we can think about like a sequence of polls, and between every two polls, uh, some people are exposed to the poll and have, get an opportunity to change your vote. So it doesn't matter uh, any order we pick them, we'll converge to some voting equilibrium. And this generalizes some uh, special cases from, from some of my previous papers. Okay, so it kind of solves your question about uh, one shot versus iterative. Um, okay, so I, I hope that convinces us that uh, uh, we get good score on theoretic criteria. And since you know I give myself medals here, so you know I might as well claim some more. So I yeah I also uh, argue that it explains so no vote paradox basically means that it's from political science say that so why do people vote usually there you know there are a million voters so this does usually refer to political voting there are uh, like million voters your chances of being pivotal are near zero why bother uh, and uh, but in this case it, it doesn't matter if you're pivotal or not pivotal because you don't know exactly as long as you may be pivotal as long as you consider yourself as potentially pivotal, it still dominates, so voting uh, locally dominates staying at home. Okay. Uh, and indeed, in the equilibria that, that we get, we get that most voters still uh, come and, and use the ballot, okay. even, though, even if they have the option to just avoid voting. voting. Do you model non-voting? Yeah, yeah, so we can, so it's not in the model that I described, but you can add like another action of just not voting that has some negligible utility, but you still have a lot of voters who, who do prefer to vote. Uh, okay, so what's left is scientific criteria. This is a bit harder, uh, so we can't really prove that it's uh, consistent with the data, but uh, we did one thing. We ran lots of computer simulations. Basically, we generated lots of uh, preference profiles according to distributions that you know, other scientists believe they capture well preferences in human societies. And, um, and we saw some findings. So first of all, if we change like, small things in the model, Nothing substantial change in the result, which is good. Uh, it's very discriminative. So uh, even though when we run, say, with different orders uh, several times, of course, we won't get to the same equilibrium, but we usually get to the same winner. Okay? So in most cases, voters will converge like, to different equilibria, but all these equilibria give us the same winner. Okay? So it's kind of consistent. It's, it's not that you know, anything can happen under this uh, a notion of voting equilibrium, uh, unlike Nash equilibrium, for example. Because remember, for every winner, we have some Nash equilibrium where this winner gets elected. Uh, ignore bust. Okay, it just means that you know it's not that if we change, you know, some time like the way we capture the the distance metric or something like that, then everything flips. So small changes in the model uh, reflecting small changes in the outcome. Uh, okay, so Duverger law is kind of a known rule of thumb from political science. Say that under uh, priority vote, most votes go to the two leading candidates, and other candidates get very few votes. So we see this very clearly in our simulations. Uh, and one thing, so you said about something good or bad. So it turns out that it increases welfare. So as far when voters are strategic and have uncertainty, they actually get to an outcome that is better than the truthful outcome. It's not very surprising because truthful outcome under plurality is often not that good. Uh, the strategic part it kind of lets them uh, exchange more information. Okay? So it's not very surprising, but it's good to know. Uh, the real test, which we're kind of doing now, is uh, doing experiments and see if either this theory or some other theories can explain well how people behave in real voting experiments. Okay? This is, these are experiments that uh, collaborate with Kobe Gal, who used to be here, is now in uh, Ben Gurion University. And I hope to update you about the, the results when we have them. Uh, OK, so this concludes the, the first part of the talk about voting. How much time do I have left to, to talk about uh, the other stuff? OK. Nothing here is not explained by the maximizing utility. 
that's in politics. I have roughly divided. I prefer every alcoholic beverage to non-alcoholic beverage. And even if I know that <laughs> wine isn't likely to get picked by beer, I no, do, I do what, how do you do your expectation over what? What are the probabilities? Where, does, where do your distribution come from? I have a belief from? as to what people would vote, which could be explained by this S. Right? I ex I what, what is this belief? the distribution over actions that I will see is this S. And so I'm taking the one that maximizes my utility. No, but S, S is not a distribution. S is just one state. It's yeah, like a point distribution. Much like Okay. you describe it as a state, you could describe it as a belief. And so the way voters respond to their belief in a classical model of... Oh, okay. So you, you, can, you can think of it as a belief where there's just uh, a probability 1 of S and probability 0 of everything else? No. So, the so what's, what's the, the distribution, distribution here? Of the vote. This is my belief, right? So maybe, maybe like adding noise to the current state. That distribution. I believe that the vote you can do that. distributed according to S. Okay, you, you can and do that. And then, I'm, and then I'm asking myself, what are all the utilities would maximize the expectation? Okay, of and course you, you can do that. There's 5% gap and very little negligible chance that an alcoholic beverage would be chosen over a non-alcoholic beverage. I would still vote for the alcoholic beverage because I get positive utility there and zero utility. Okay, you can model noise. Uh, I, I think it's definitely possible. I don't think that uh, it will... Uh, I also think you get similar results, okay? I think that uh, modeling it like this is uh, much simpler, okay, without the probabilities. Uh, in the end, okay, both uh, probabilities and like strict uncertainty, they're both abstractions of how like people capture uncertainty, okay? And uh, I s in this case, I don't think that uh, uh, probabilities are a very good abstraction to how people behave or think about these situations, and I think that... Okay, so uh, you know, we can uh, make it off. So, okay, if you have more questions about the voting part, then uh, speak up now, and otherwise we'll move to the, to the next one. Uh, okay, so if, uh, if we go back to where we introduced uh, uncertainty, then uh, note that uh, nothing here is, so you said that we can easily extend it to other uh, uh, like scoring rules, other voting rules, but we can also extend this kind of a definition of possible states to other games, okay? So nothing here is, is specific to, to voting. We can just say that you know, given some state, which is just a vector, uh, an agent can consider as possible states all vectors or all states that are sufficiently close to this state, okay? Uh, and instead of talking about uh, score vectors, so we just talk about some prospective state, which is shared among all, uh, all, vote, all agents, all players in this case, and uh, some uncertainty level, which is private. Uh, so we can think about some other examples. This is still quite close to voting. We can think about scheduling. So does anyone know uh, Doodle? This is a screenshot of, of Doodle. <laughs> uh, Doodle, uh, you set up a meeting, or someone sets up a meeting, and sends it to everyone, and people get an opportunity to say which slots are good for them and which are not good. So the good, the green ones are, are the ones that are good for the meeting, and we can see the uh, people's names here. And uh, basically, this is what you see. So you see the responses of the previous respondents, and now you have an opportunity uh, to, to say um, your availability. And uh, in a recently published paper, uh, we showed that people are actually being strategic when they're filling up this. Uh, so this is based on empirical analysis of, a, of like 300,000 doodle polls. Turns out that people strategically mark additional slots that are unpopular, okay? Like this slot, okay? And uh, if you, well, our guess at least of why people do that is that it makes them appear more uh, cooperative, you know, without kind of taking a risk of actually selecting a, a bad slot for them. Uh, so this is a nice heuristic, but uh, the question here, can we maybe justify it with a better uh, model of, of uncertainty of w how unpopular it should be, for example? How do you uh, know they're acting strategically? Yeah, how uh, do you know that maybe... Yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, uh, we compared uh, polls where they can't see the previous responses mm -hmm. with polls where they can't see the previous responses. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And, uh, and you can see that uh, very clearly. Okay. It, it's a very strong effect. Um, OK, so we can think about, again, as these time slots are just, uh, so we have a state, which is just the number of approvals on each time slot. And we have some uncertainty, only in this case, maybe these uncertainty intervals are, are more appropriate, because votes can only be added. Um, and according to this, OK, so suppose that I'm good with Thursday at 10, so these two are, are good for me. Uh, but say that they asked me to, to mark more than two, uh, or I want to mark more to, to appear more cooperative, I can also, also see that these ones have very few votes, so I may not consider them as possible winners. So that it's safe for a strategic vote, so I can add them to my vote without taking too much risk and, uh, and not approving the other ones. Okay. Um, a completely different game. Okay, we can think about a route, routing game or congestion game. Okay, in these games, uh, agents need to select paths from some source to some target, and uh, they pay some cost. So uh, and there's some cost function on every edge. Uh, the exact formal model does not matter. Uh, what matters is that your cost depends on the total congestion. So your cost depends on how many other people also chose that path or that edge. Okay. Um, so these are, suppose that these are the congestions. So same, we can model this just as a vector of congestion, the congestion on each edge. And say, you don't know the congestion exactly, but say if you heard the news, and you know more or less what traffic is, but you don't trust it completely, then you can take some range uh, around it. And uh, suppose you're risk averse, uh, maybe you want to take a, a path that doesn't uh, reduces the, you know, the, the most likely or even the, the expected travel time, but uh, maybe the worst case travel time. And again, it's worst case according to what you believe to be possible. Okay? And if you want to kind of switch between the um, probabilistic and the strict uncertainty model, so you can think about maybe this is a noise and then think, okay, some, maybe there's a fixed noise which is known, and some agents say only consider uh, one standard deviation and others are maybe more risk averse, so they consider two standard deviations, so they have a larger interval. Okay, and if you want to hear more about that, then I'm, I'll talk about uncertainty and congestion games on, on Friday in the EconCS talk. Uh, okay, so uh, if you want to kind of derive a recipe for how to treat uncertainty in, in general games, or for which general games it might be useful, because I'm not arguing that it's a good uncertainty model for any game. So uh, think about games where we have some uh, perspective state that we can describe as a vector. Uh, the vector that is induced by, by the current action profile. And, and uh, so we only care about games where we can kind of model the entire uh, state space uh, where we have some natural metric over states. Okay? So both in congestion games and in voting games, we have very natural metrics because these are just uh, uh, vectors and it's likely you know, that very close co uh, congestion is also more likely. Okay. In other games, there may not be some natural metric, metric like this. Uh, okay. Then we take uh, some range okay, around this, uh, this uh, uh, perspective state to get the set of possible states. Okay. So this gives us the uncertainty of the agents. Uh, what we need is their behavior, and here there's no one answer. So if we have a probability, there's just one reasonable answer. Right? If you have a probability, you maximize your expected utility. Okay. If you have strict uncertainty, it's not clear what you should do. There are some options that have been discussed uh, in length, at length in the literature. For example, you can try to minimize your worst case cost. So, that's my cue. <laughs> okay, uh, a more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so we can think of a more refined notion where uh, uh, people try instead to minimize the worst case regret, uh, or we can think of something much weaker as we did in, in the voting model, where we're not assuming any particular behavior like this. We only say that uh, people avoid playing something that is dominated. Okay, so if you don't know the distribution, but you only know, say, the support of the distribution, you can say, you know, I, I, 
I can't commit to how you're going to act, but I'm trying to analyze your behavior. I, I only assume that you're not doing something very stupid. Okay. Or you know, maybe have other ideas uh, how to act under strict uncertainty. No, it doesn't have to be. It's just the uncertainty model, okay? So the action here, so what would be a reasonable... Yeah, so I didn't talk about behavior here almost at all, so except for this short line, okay? I'm only talking about, I'm only talking about the uncertainty model, okay? So it's kind of a modeler model, okay? You can think about the uncertainty and use similar, like, model uncertainty in similar ways in completely different settings, but if you think about the behavior, Okay, then you know, maybe in different settings you need to think there are more reasonable behavior. So local dominance maybe makes sense in voting, but here, worst case, uh, a, a cost minimization is, is, makes more sense. No, I know, but uh, I mean, here I don't have to choose one edge uh, reasoning about this model of uncertainty that I have. Yeah, you don't choose one edge, you choose one path. Okay. It's a set of edges that has to, have to constitute a path from yeah. here to yeah, but your uncertainty over edges also kind of induces your uncertainty about the, the total cost function. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you study in the different setting whether it's easy or difficult computationally to decide what is your best way of behaving given your model. You know, so, so that will be, you know, it's a very general question. It, it highly depends you know, on the specifics of the model, okay? And which behavior you assume, uh, what, how exactly you define the, the action space and so on. Because you said that in the case of causality that you showed, that yeah. it's easy yeah. computationally yeah. to find the threshold. Yeah, not just computationally, so it's, it's kind of, uh, it boils down to a simple heuristic, okay? So maximizing expected utility is also often easy computationally, but it's just not very, not easy in practice. <coughs> um, Okay, so this concludes most of what I wanted to say. Uh, if we have time, I uh, thought that you can choose if you want to talk like two slides on <laughs> uncertainty, so the connection with model logic or uh, about equilibrium as an abstraction. Or we can just, you know, wrap up if, if you're fed up with it. So who, who uh, prefers, who, who votes for model logic? Yeah, you only have one iteration. <laughs> who votes for model logic? One, okay. two. Who votes for abstraction? Five. Who want to go home, or eat, or something? Okay. Who votes strategically? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, so I'll say a few words about uh, this. Ah. Why is the one green and the other not? Uh, that's a good question. He was trying to see. I don't know much about computers, so uh, I think maybe because I clicked it uh, when I. Dry run and did a dry run. Okay, so um, if you kind of not game theory experts and these notations seem uh, kind of Greek, Greek to you, so you can just look at the picture. Uh, so pure Nash equilibrium, it's basically just a state where when everybody best responds to this state, we get the same state. Okay, so that's something very clear. Okay, uh, if we think about something more general, like a, a mixed Nash equilibrium, and to some extent this, uh, this extends to base Nash equilibrium, it's a distribution, okay, distribution over actions or action profiles. And again, if everybody best responds to this distribution, we get the same distribution. Okay, so these two are, are consistent in some very strong sense. Okay, that's why game theorists and economists like them. Uh, something that uh, is perhaps a bit less consistent, but gets closer to, uh, uh, to what I want and, and also maybe kind of bridges the gap between some things we discussed, okay, is what's called a trembling hand perfection. So a trembling hand per perfection equilibrium is still a single state, so it's kind of like a pure Nash equilibrium, but the agents are not assumed to respond exactly to this state, but they assume that there's some noise around this state, okay, and they react to this noise. Okay, so they, they, did, they do the best thing Assuming that the state is a bit noisy. Okay, so in the model we abstract the outcome as a single state, okay, but the agents don't think about it as a single state, but as a distribution. And usually we think about it as, as a distribution that is very like, highly concentrated about the state. So it's like a tiny noise, typically. 
so uh, our notion or my notion is somewhat similar to that with two differences. So we still, as an abstraction, we still model the state as a single state, but again, agents do not respond to the single state, but to a set of states, okay? Uh, and the two differences, or maybe the three differences, are first, that this is not a distribution, but an actual set. Second, that we don't assume that it's negligible, that it can be substantial. You can have substantial uncertainty, okay, and react to that. And third, is that different agents may have different uncertainty levels, but in the end, where, when everybody best responds to their own kind of set of possible worlds, we get the same state. Okay? The latter two are not always known for good. What's that? The latter two are not always known for good. Oh, so in general, you know, this pure equilibrium also may or may not exist. Okay, so I showed that in, in the voting model, this always exists. Okay, so of course, in every model, we, you need to prove that whether it exists or you know, under what restrictions it exists and so on. Okay, um, yeah, so if we wrap up, okay, so I introduced a model for agents with uncert uncertainty where the uncertainty is over the actions of others, or probabilities, okay. Uh, I, I see this as a contribution. I, I know that it's, it's an it's a uphill combat, okay. Uh, and probabilities are deeply entrenched. And uh, in, in many, um, many domains, I think it's for a very good reason. In some domains, I think it's very hard to justify probabilistic reasoning, okay? And uh, in a lot of games, uh, it's kind of unlikely that people, that's what they do. It's not clear where they get their distributions from. Uh, and another key point is that the bounded rational player acts as if is a single decision maker. Okay, so when you think about, so this relates to, uh, or someone asked here something about the, how do you know the, pre or you asked him, how do you know the preferences of others? So not that you don't care about the preferences of others. Okay, like that when you commute to work, you don't care about, you know, where are everybody's offices and how fast they want to get there and if they're hurry, in a hurry to a meeting or not, okay? You only care where they're going to go. So you only care about people's actions, okay? not about their preferences and not if they're rational, okay? And again, this does not apply to any game. So in auction, it's kind of problematic because we are assuming that other are rational and kind of trying to recursively model the reasoning, but uh, we usually don't do that in situations like voting and, and congestion games, and perhaps others, okay? Uh, okay, equilibrium just means that everybody believes they play well. This relates to what we just discussed, and I, hope I uh, convince you that it's useful for voting and for congestion games and perhaps you can think of other situations where basically kind of these two things apply. Um, that's it. And yeah, I think that leads to my homepage, maybe. <laughs> okay. If you have any more questions, then yeah, shoot. Um, yeah, okay. Everything in there has equal probability? No. <laughs> no, because uh, then, if you think that, then you know, the uh, best thing you do is just maximize your expected, you'd have some notion of expected utility. Okay? Uh, I mean, you can think that, but the notion of dominance ignores that. So it ignores what probabilities you assign to, to the different possible states. And, and for the voting game, like the your, your definition of like people only vote for the uh, people only change when like the dominance kind of stuff is like to avoid the worst case right? or to get the best possible or okay so if, if you think first of all if you think about it in in a static mode like as a one shot game it just means that people avoid doing something that is really stupid okay so if they currently vote for something that they believe is bad for them or there's something that is strictly you know always better for them then they do it, okay? Equilibrium is, is just a state where no one votes kind of against their own, like strongly against their own beliefs, okay? Uh, and if it's kind of this iterative uh, setting, then um, it assumes some very strong form of loss aversion. So you, I only move if I have some very strict reason to move. If it may hurt me even just a little bit, but even if I can gain a lot, potentially, then I don't do it. I 
Uh, understand that this is a very very strict notion. I only work. I also work on some kind of uh, uh, more uh, I know softer versions of it. Um, so, like I said, so if we take like these two abstractions of probabilities, so probabilities are very extreme in one sense because they specify exactly what you should do, and they're you know very sensitive to uh, if I if to outliers. Say if you take one, uh, even something with low probability that but that affects your uh, utility very much, it kind of shifts your entire expected utility. So this is on one end, this notion is very non-sensitive, and so. Maybe we want something in the middle, but I think it's it's good to you know, first study the, the clean cases. Okay, thank you.